Okay. <laughs> so it all started with biomass. And this is biological investigations in marine animal systems and stocks, which was developed in the mid-1970s. And this was a time when there was all-out exploitation of the fin fisheries in the Antarctic. And also it was at a time when people had discovered massive uh, krill stocks, Antarctic krill, in fact, was superba, and um, had all sorts of ideas of feeding the starving masses with an unlimited, unending supply of Antarctic krill. And um, a group of international scientists involved in Antarctic research were concerned about this and thought that it would be relatively it would be really important to get some baseline information about the structure and functioning of the Antarctic marine ecosystem for managing in the future. And because of this you know, interest in krill as an unlimited resource, it, it was a fairly uh, krill-centric study. And with the fact that krill is um, a keystone organism, it's the base of a very important food web, the most important keystone species in the uh, transfer of energy from phytoplankton, which krill grazes on, to higher trophic levels. So they came up with a 10-year research program involving two large-scale oceanographic surveys, involved 13 ships, 11 nations, with the greatest effort off the Antarctic Peninsula. The first was Fidex, the first international biomass experiment in 1980-81, and the second in 1984-1985. The U.S. involvement in um, this was rather limited um, since this was essentially a fisheries-focused pro program. NSF really couldn't get involved because they are essentially supposed to focus on um, non-commercial um, science projects, whereas National Marine Fishery Service is responsible for fisheries and harvesting um, focused studies. So it was a joint cruise with uh, script scientists doing academic work and NIMS and Narragansett scientists doing the fisheries related research. So uh, we had the Vulcan 7 cruise in March, April 1981 and Proteus 6 in February, March 1984. These are both summer, optional summer cruises. Okay, and the focus of the majority of the biomass research was in the Antarctic Peninsula region. Uh, you can see here uh, it is sort of the upstream area from one of from the most extensive uh, areas of krill biomass in the Southern Ocean. The, Vul the Vulcan uh, 7 cruise in 1981 I was not part of, but my classmate uh, from Scripps was, and um, I served as his lab technician. When he came back with the samples, I processed all the krill and salps and other larger zooplankton and samples. Well, in 1981, um, the researchers were blessed with a super abundance of krill. And in fact, my colleague um, wrote a paper uh, on a super swarm of krill. And since many people um, had this as their first experience in the Antarctic, they thought that super swarms of krill were the norm. So three years later, we had to buy up uh, the Protea 6 cruise, and I was involved in that. And it was entirely the scripts portion was the physics, chemistry, and biology of krill superstorms. Well, we hardly caught any, any krill. In fact, our nets were just clogged with this gelatinous zooplankton called a cell 
This is Alpha Thompson I. It is the biomass dominant uh, south of the Southern Ocean. And we, we came out of this experience with virtually no krill, nothing really learned about krill except as a comparison to 1981. But there was a, um, a very, very important uh, paper that came out dedicated to the uh, trophodynamics and physiology of Stella Thompson. Okay, so this cruise happened right after the major 1983 hit the California Current. And compared to um, the people from Europe and Australia who were involved, we went, well, gee, this is related to El Nino. It was a no-brainer. And so we had kind of like, you know, a, an idea that perhaps this wasn't that abnormal. It's just that people hadn't really experienced it before. But um, we also recognized that it was ecologically quite significant in that the krill and salps are filter feeders, small particles in the water column, but they represent two different dichotomous regimes. Krill requires high productivity. They are, they have um, amino fatty acids that are built up in the springtime that are totally dependent on super abundant phytoplankton at the wrong, right time to be able to develop their eggs and spawn. And um, so their reproductive success, which is dependent on lots of phytoplankton, is what uh, dictates their uh, recruitment, their spawning recruitment, and availability to higher trophic levels. Contrarily, salps have a problem if they run into too many particulates. They inhale water, goes to the mucus net. If there's too much phytoplankton in the water, their nets clog, they choke to death and drown. So um, basically, they're a low productivity organism. They're <coughs> not a major prey item for higher trophic levels. And so their carbon energy, instead of going to feed you know, marine mammals and seabirds, um, instead is lost to the deep sea, where it's sequestered through their dense uh, fecal pellets. So major, major dichotomy in trophodynamics with implications. Well, okay, after the biomass cruises, uh, the, the field season pretty much ran out, but the work that I was involved in didn't die in that Ken Sherman, the um, director of the Nemsen Air Advanced Lab, had, who had been one of the original developers of the biomass program convinced uh, the U.S. government that we needed to have a U.S. delegation as part of CAMELAR, which is the Con Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And so in 1986, he got government support for a new Antarctic <coughs> Marine Living Resource project that was based in uh, Narragansett. Uh, we spent, and I was fortunate that I was included in that program. We spent uh, two field seasons on a Polish research vessel, and for one reason or another, <coughs> Ken Sherman and Amlar were taken away from Amlar. Amlar was transferred to La Jolla, to the Southwest Fishery Science Center and put under the um, control of Rennie and Roger Hewitt, which was not a bad thing. Because Rennie and Roger, within a year of inheriting this program, established a cow coffee type sampling regime that led to the long-term database 
like Cal Coffee here, essential for being able to assess and statistically identify those factors driving ecosystem variability. So in 1990, um, we established uh, a survey grid off the Antarctic Peninsula, and all of the um, interest in my portion of the, the Avalar program was looking at krill stock sizes, reasons for the causes underlying variable krill re produce, recruitment success, and the supply to predators, meaning higher, uh, higher predator trophic levels, and including the fisheries. And uh, Rennie and Roger would then go and present our results to the camera meetings in Hobart, Australia, every year. <clears throat> the research area, like the biomass studies, was focused off the Antarctic Peninsula region. Uh, this is an incredibly important krill spawning and nursery ground. It's also an important commercial uh, krill fishery area, and it is ex really easily accessible from South America for the three-day transit. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> We established uh, multi multidisciplinary research cruises. They, they were generally two one-month-long cruises during Austral summer, January, February, February, March, each year with about 100 stations <coughs> to survey. For 15 of the 23 years, uh, we were using a wonderful Russian uh, Fisheries vessel to use more geologia. Um, our, at each station, we had um, CTD casts with carousels taking uh, some water samples for uh, primary production, and we had um, uh, zoophyte connect sampling with the Isaac's Kid and water trawl 505 mesh net geared to catch mid and larger size organisms. We also had um, continual underway acoustic biomass assessment. Um, and also later on in the program, we had underway bird and mammal observations. And we continued this way for 17, 18 years. 1993, I took over the zooplankton as well as krill component. And because there was no money for post-cruise analysis, Roger and Rennie uh, allowed me to set up an onboard zooplankton sample processing and um, identification um, team, usually eight people. We got to the point where we were identifying more than 100 zooplankton taxa including uh, larval curl down to stages of development, all using fresh material collected with one to two hours uh, before. And we had data entry, proofing, preliminary analyses done at the end of each one month cruise. Um, <clears throat> I don't think very many people have done this before. But um, had we not had that, we wouldn't have had any zone content results because the program didn't have money to support anything other than this. Okay, so Randy and Roger uh, helped me out in the early days by uh, establishing a collaboration with a uh, German krill expert by the name of uh, Volker Siegel from uh, Ham the Sea Fisheries Institute in Hamburg, Germany. And he brought along to this collaboration the German research data from Elephant Island area that had been collected between 1979 and 1990, 91. And we combined our databases from that and started focusing on um, <clears throat> what was underlying uh, krill recruitment success. And at that time, about the only thing we really had available were early satellite 
based images of sea ice extent. So we, we both had this uh, assertion that the sea ice cycles were involved with promoting krill reproduction and recruitment success. And so we um, came up with a couple of papers, the first in 1995, the second was published as a cover article in Nature in 1997 using this 14-year-long uh, data set. And we came up with these statistically solid results that extensive sea ice favors early krill spawning in spring and ultimate recruitment success the next year. Krill has, um, spawns in summer and recruitment occurs the following summer. So one year animals. Um, and that these huge sow blooms that we encountered frequently um, followed poor sea ice development. And so we, we came up with this hypothesis that these huge fluctuations, uh, the Bucodinus, um, you know, productivity regimes of krill and cells are driven by sea ice cycles. And then things changed. 1998. You know, when you're there and you see your nets coming up and everything is different, you go, aha, uh -huh, there's a regime shift. Well, there was a regime shift in 1998. Coincidental with the regime shift that happened off the California current, in the California current. But one thing is that zooplankton became much more fun. And the abundance was um, due largely to copepods, which had been relatively rare prior to that time. They became, the assemblages became much more diverse. We had so many more taxa represented. And the sound blooms became, became less frequent. And after this regime shift, um, the sea ice retreat, which had been <coughs> starkly evident, between 1980 and 1992 stabilized. So physically, climatically, biologically, ecologically, there was a different kettle of crow. And so back to drawing board. Uh, <coughs> new collaboration. This time with Eileen Hoffman and John Klink, physical oceanographers with a wealth of Antarctic experience at Old Dominion University. And then Osmond Hansen, um, Tyler <coughs> Plankton guy at Scripps, who was responsible for the uh, primary production component of Animar. And Warren White, who is an atmospheric uh, physicist with um, experience with Antarctic <laughs> climate. Uh, he had come up with the Antarctic Circumpolar Wave, which when we started this investigation, we thought might be the link between El Nino and what we were getting. So uh, what I'm going to go to now is uh, are the results that came out of two papers, one in 2009-2010, having to do with ENSO and hydrographic control of the Antarctic marine ecosystem. So for this, we used uh, 25 years of environmental data. Um, and we included the uh, atmospheric uh, and sea surface temperature indices <coughs> representative of the El Nino Southern Ocean Oscillation. Um, the Nino index has to do with sea surface temperature anomalies in equatorial Pacific and the Southern Ocean, the Southern Oscillation Index has to do with sea surface pressure anomalies between Tahiti and Darwin, Australia. 
Um, the two of them are, they're in phase, but of different directions. So strong SOIs is, is always associated with a weak mean of 3.4. And you can see that in the long-term section. The um, darker bars are El Nino events. The lighter bars are La Nina, the tighter part <coughs> of first half. Then we brought in sea ice extent, uh, the abundance of South Thompson I, chlorophyll A concentrations from different portions of our survey area, copepod abundance, larval krill abundance, post-larval krill abundance, and krill recruitment. And for whatever years we could, of course, uh, you know, the copepod and larval krill abundance didn't come in until I took over the program in 93. So that was a, a limit, relatively limited. But we ran uh, a bunch of cross-correlation coefficients uh, with uh, zero lag. Oops, on. Um, oops, I knew I was going to do that. Okay. Uh, <coughs> zero lag uh, on the right and uh, one year lag on the left. I'll only really discuss the um, zero lag in this correlation um, results here. <coughs> but uh, using this long-term data set, we found significant positive correlations between chlorophyll A, primary production, and copepods, chlorophyll A and krill larva. Krill larvae and copepods are positively uh, related. And chlorophyll A, productivity and copepod abundance were all positively correlated with the SOI index. So this comes down to what I was talking about before, the, the importance of primary production. And it, um, in krill reproduction and in um, just ecosystem health diversity abundance <coughs> as a whole. And then, uh, of course, as before, the sea ice extent uh, was related to, uh, uh, no, what we found is that the sea ice extent was related to SOI and ENSO. So what we've been monitoring before, sea ice extent, was basically a proxy for ENSO forcing. And as before, we found that cell abundance was negatively correlated with sea ice extent. And um, so this, these results support our original observations that these changes between krill and cells have to do with productivity regimes. But how? So that's where Eileen and John uh, worked magic. <coughs> to understand the, the physical oceanography of the Antarctic Peninsula, you have to understand the importance of the southern portion of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. This is the body of water that encircles the entire Antarctic uh, continent, but at Drake Passage, it is the, at its choke point. It is at its narrowest latitudinal extent. And here, the major features, the southern ACC, ACC front and the boundary approach the Antarctic continent. And the interaction between currents and bottom topography, as we know in the California current, as with upwelling, is very important. OK, so the southern front of the ACC, it's a current jet. And because, because, oh, come on, Valerie. I knew you were going to do this. Because of shoaling southward, the current jet and the circumpolar 
deep water, which is high nutrient, which it contains, comes close to the shore and close to the surface. Basically, it's analogous to upwelling off the California coastline. <clears throat> and the southern boundary of the ACC is the southern limit of the circumpolar deep water. In essence, between, at once past the boundary, you get into a low productivity zone. It's got iron, but it doesn't have nitrogen and phosphate. Low productivity. The boundary marks the high productivity versus low productivity zone on the peninsula. Um, another thing that's important about the uh, jet, the ACC jet, being off the peninsula close to shore is that this is an important mechanism for transporting krill around the economy. Larval krill um, are, that, that krill eggs are dense, they sink down, and the developmental time of the eggs and subsequent and our, uh, larval ascent depend on the larvae reaching the warm waters of the upper circumpolar deep water to enhance developmental rates so they can swim to the surface and get to where all the goodies are to take advantage of the uh, primary production in the summer and um, survive. But also it's a source of uh, transportation away from the area or to areas where they get recycled in shore. This is why the Antarctic Peninsula is an important nursery ground because it has the proximity of warm, nutrient-rich water and it is in an area where you have transport away but also recirculation for retention. Okay, so using the CTD data that we have collected in this Elephant Island box, uh, Eileen and John looked at temperature at the 350 meter level. <coughs> this is where circumpolar deep water has its signature adjacent to the coast. And we had three different lines that they looked at, and you can see over time that there are seasonal and interannual and longer term, term changes in the water mass influences in the survey area. Here um, we can see these with relation to El Nino in red and La Nina in blue. During El Nino, you find that, contrary to what you think, that the waters are colder in the area and that there is essentially continental water moving offshore as opposed to La Nina. La Nina, when you had an onshore presence of circumpolar deep water. So these are fairly significant water mass influences in the survey area related to ENSO. Okay, why? How can you explain these differences? Well, we came up with the fact that the southern boundary and the southern front are not fixed entities. They are highly mobile. And their latitudinal location changes depending on ocean atmospheric coupled processes. And so during La Nina, <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> During La Nina, you have a onshore movement of the southern front of ACC, shoaling of the nutrient-rich circumpolar deep water. You have the onshore presence of this diverse zooplankton assemblage. And with, um, this is associated with increased northwest winds, which help bring the nutrient-rich circumpolar deep water close to the surface. You have mixing between the oceanic nutrient-rich waters and coastal waters in the, in the upper water column. And because of this, you get not only rich oceanic zooplankton, but you have increased uh, primary production because of the, the mixture of iron-rich coastal waters and nitrogen and phosphate-rich oceanic waters mixing off the continental shelf. In contrast, during El Nino, the ACC Southern Front is moved offshore. And so you have an offshore movement of depauperate zooplankton. And without this strong mixing of the uh, circumpolar deep water and coastal waters, you have low primary production. <clears throat> okay, what is behind um, well, fortunately, by the time we came to this point in our research, there was enough um, ancillary satellite-based information, sophisticated modeling techniques, and um, Juan and Martinson from, um, you know, uh, East Coast, sorry, like that, came up with this Antarctic dipole scenario, which for the 10 years after we started working with this has never let me down in terms of my appreciation of the variability of the Antarctic ecosystem. And it has to do with atmospheric ramifications of warm water in the equatorial Pacific during El Nino, cold water during uh, La Nina. And um, basically with the uh, El, El Nino, you have weak northwest wind anomalies, you have contracted sea ice extends, and um, then during La Nina, you have warm sea ice anomalies, strong northwest winds, and expanded sea ice extends. To make a little bit more sense of this, I always look at warm sea surface temperatures and think of a kettle. When you've got warm water, you've got steam coming off, You've got a low pressure that sucks atmospheric features towards it. So, during El Nino, hmm. why am I? I hit the wrong button. Okay, during El Nino, because of this, the subtropical atmospheric jets move northward. And so in the South Pacific, you have low northwesterly winds. And in contrast, in the South Atlantic, you've got a southern movement of the subtropical and the polar frontal jets, which with strong north west winds in the South Atlantic 
beef up the clockwise circulation of the wet L child. And with this, as we were discussing before, you have a decreased primary production in the South Pacific. Everything has just kind of relaxed. And this graphic, I think about the Antarctic dipole as a teeter totter. <coughs> and the normal El Nino La Nina is the fat kid switches sides on the teeter totter. So in El Nino, you've got the polar frontal jets into the Red Sea area. You've got intensified winds there, energizing the Red Gyral, setting up eddies, warm core rings, and advecting salps from downstream into this gyral that brings them to the Antarctic Peninsula. Then it goes to La Nina. The fat kid changes sides. All of a sudden, the system off the Antarctic Peninsula, the South Pacific, ramps up. You've got increased polar frontal jets, increased northwest winds. The uh, southern front of the ACC approaches the coast. You've got higher productivity. You've got lots of zooplankton. You've got happy and no cells, or not so many. Okay, so in 1998, yes, there was a regime shift. Um, this is demonstrated by a statistic, statistically significant increase in copepod abundance, decrease in South of Thompson Eye abundance. And um, this just shows how the water mass affiliations of a variety of zooplankton species um, affects their abundance in the survey area. The one and two and three water masses are open ocean. The four or five are continental masses. And after the regime shift, um, aside from, from South of Thompson I, copepods, you have another euphalsia, euphalsia frigida, uh, thysanoesome, curl larvae, an amphipod, ketogenous, another amphipod, all were more abundant after the regime shift. This means that the fat kid is sitting on that side of the teeter totter and is staying there for a while. Is it okay to ask a question? Yeah. Okay, ask a question. Yeah, sure. I noted that the numbers were um, hundreds of organisms per hundreds of cubic meters. Is that correct? A thousand cubic meters. Like you move oh, back side? Here it says uh, per hundred cubic oh, meters. Oh, I'm sorry, that should be a thousand. That's sorry. not very many, is it? Oh, come on. It's not that rich of an ecosystem. The biomass That's one per meter cube, yeah. whereas we would have 10 per liter. Yes, yeah. okay. But the curl biomass, no, it's, believe me, we use, we use a 1.8 meter square, I was just kidding, in water trawl. When I did my research work in the um, central gyre, we used a mid-water trawl only twice as big. So with about the same amount of catch. No, no. It's. And are those king size copepods, for instance? These are biomass dominant ones. Yes. Um, they, these tend to be about the size of a grain of, of rice. Bigger than a millimeter. Yeah. Yes. Five or five mesh hand. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Um, there's not. These guys, they might not be plentiful, but they're big and they live a long time. So what they make up in numbers, they, I think, offset in biomass yeah. and longevity. They're trade-offs. OK, so basically, our 30 years of research 
has come up with the fact that ENSO drives interannual and longer scale ecosystem variability through basin scale climate variability of the Antarctic Diagonal that's the Pacific South American pattern. Okay, and during the early part of the, the long-term data set, sea ice variability appeared to be the dominant factor. But after the sea ice sort of stabilized due to atmospheric processes, um, the um, ecosystem variability was directly associated with fluctuations of so. Okay, so in evolutionary term, the the Antarctic, the Southern Ocean Belt, its unique um, composition of organisms after the um, Great Passage of about 25 million years ago. This was essentially where it started to get by by geographically isolated, and euphausian uh, genetic studies have shown that the separation of five euphausian species of the southern ocean happened around three million years ago. Um, and there are there are differential affiliations with permanent pack ice, seasonal ice, and open ocean conditions suggest that the sea ice habitat um, formed about that time. Okay, and ice core records have shown that there have been periods of warming and cooling, glacial retreat advanced over at least in the last several million years. And the major changes in the krill distribution, population size, and likely of the other organisms are probably associated with these with the implication that long-term, large-scale variations, sea ice, atmospheric oceanic circulation, processes, and so the Antarctic dipole um, underlie the evolutionary history of the organisms here. And in terms of the impact, um, as far as the literature goes, it goes from the West Antarctic to the East Antarctic, at least of half the, circum of the circumference of the Antarctic is subject to environmental forcing by Enso. So, um, in acknowledgments, Greg Kaye, if it were not for Greg, I wouldn't have been able to come home. He brought me here to collaborate with him back in the early 1980s, before, just before I got involved in the Antarctic research. And I want to thank this amazing research and educational institution for making me feel welcome for <clears throat> several decades. <laughs> <laughs> and I want, I have so much appreciation for writing home with Roger with Hewitt for establishing Count Coffee in Antarctica and for having faith in me and my obstinate insistence on figuring it all out, which led to support for a fairly long time, which I'm forever grateful for. And also to the captains, crew members, and hundreds of field season participants and zone team members, including the 12 students I brought from Mosline Green Labs to help me, particular Ned Lehman and Don Altrin, who got their master's degree based on um, Avalar work. Lynn McMasters helped with most of the illustrations. And John and Event Black, thank you for yanking me out of my hole in the Norte. And <laughs> Oh. And <laughs> <laughs> I
this a little bit. It doesn't describe variability in the ecosystem throughout, say, the Rossi area. What's happening there? Uh, believe it or not. Is this connected? I mean, it's Rossi. Believe it or not, once in a while, it is connected. Dave Ainley. Okay. I'm working on uh, Iuthausia on my paper now, looking at Euthausia um, abundance variability. And it turns out in this mid 1970s period, when all the massive krill were reported, it wasn't just in the Arab Peninsula, it was the entire Arab circumpolar. There were not different different years, but Dave Ainley reported this. He talked about a regime shift happening over in the west, extreme west of Antarctic, back in 1976. That's when all of the krill went crazy, and I think it ties into warm nights Antarctic circumpolar way. I think that once in a while things work together and you have optimal conditions for krill hyperactivity around the entire Antarctic continent, likely related to forcing coming out of the Southern Ocean and the Indian Ocean section. And it, it's really kind of amazing because um, it was this circumpolar super abundance of super swarms of krill that have been used as baseline for saying that krill stocks in the Antarctic are crashing. <sighs> okay, so um, I do, and in the circumpolar way that uh, Warren White described, it preceded the regime shift in 1998. By the time that happened, the circumpolar wave was no longer noted. I'm not an atmospheric girl, but I have a feeling every once in a while that things work together. The regime shift is most likely due to another atmospheric modulation that operates on a longer time frame. And so cycles five to three to five years. By the way, Antarctic krill life cycle directly related to Enso periodicity. They need two back-to-back -back years of high productivity. They spawn, the first year to spawn, second for recruitment success. They don't get to be mature, fully mature and reproductive another three years and so cycle. No doubt. Cells. They need two back-to-back -back years to get reproductively successful and given a sequence of the right physical conditions, they have a population group. Both of them, these two major um, dominant, vitamins dominant organisms, have life cycles totally intimately connected to ENSO. And the thing is, they're certain polar in the distribution. Where they thrive, well, that's another story. But yeah, even though it's local, it acts certain polarly, certain polar in some interesting. Big, big science. Mm -hmm. So um, I see that there's a flip flop there, so the dipole between um, with the and so with lighting yet and only between the stops and trail. But now that we've had this regime shift and we have this higher diversity uh, community, um, is there a similar swap going back going back and forth between and lining and lining? Yes, yeah, it's okay. just that it's it's not as intense. Okay. Unfortunately, the Amlar program and long-term database are dead. And I'm, I'm working with uh, physical ocean experts groups of ADCP 
Um, and she has found a increased trend for that status since 19, since 2008. We're funded um, to go on the supply transfer road passage, and my hypothesis is that that increased backscatter is indeed krill, which, because of more La Ninas than El Ninos, is undergoing a slow but constant population buildup. But you're still having, like, like here, this year, um, or two years ago, you know, massive, massive upwelling. Massive krill swarms. Everybody is going crazy, but we're still going to get an Alpino next year. The Antarctic and the Antarctic Peninsula and California are others. It's a question on your answer then. So, how big is a Eupausid that that is two years old? Okay, full grown superba is about 60 millimeters. Okay. Two-year-old is about 35 millimeters. But there are a lot of us. I can't believe that, uh, that you can have a uh, two-year-old zooplankton look around not being consumed left and right. Uh, there's a lot of us. Where do they? Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, well, no, the krill are high. That small. A oh, high density. The, the krill are high density. We don't sample the krill that well. They, you know, they, they're used to uh, whales. <laughs> Playing to net. Thanks very much, Val. And you guys now know where she is. She's down in Norte. So you're always going to find her. 